We're gonna be taking a tour around New York State and hearing about all of these fantastic community-driven, equitable, clean transportation projects that we wanna see funded. And I'll, I'll say when we first started organizing this event, uh, it was in collaboration with a campaign we've been working on, the New Yorkers for a transportation and climate initiative, NY for TCI. Uh, and since, since we started working on it, uh, TCI has had some setbacks, but uh, we are still you know, committed to the program and want people to take action uh, by supporting it, signing our petition, which Mick will put in the chat, uh, to send a message to Governor Hochul on TCI, and that we hope to see TCI included in the Climate Action Council's plan that will also be circulating across the state next year and, and lots of opportunities for public comment on that. And in the meantime, uh, since we started organizing this, we've also had a huge, uh, exciting bill pass um, at, the, at the federal level uh, with the bipartisan infrastructure bill. That means many, many billions of dollars coming to New York State to be invested in clean transportation projects, which is really, really exciting. And so this is kind of a perfect time to delve into the projects that people are working on on the ground. Um, many of these projects need more support uh, from funding. Uh, and so whether it's uh, in the short term from the federal government's infrastructure uh, money coming to New York or in the future with TCI, uh, we're delighted to get to hear from our friends and colleagues around the state on the great projects that we're, they're working on. So um, let's see, I think we will, we were going to start with Doug, but I think Doug, you're still working on getting your screen sharing situation sorted out. So perfectly okay. Um, we will instead start, this is a very cool project. Um, it's super cutting edge. Uh, Andy Wilner, who is the executive director of the Center for Post-Carbon Logistics, presenting solar powered boats in the Hudson Valley. Uh, a very intriguing project uh, that Andy's been working on and excited to hear about it. Um, so Andy, I will pass it off to you uh, and hopefully you will be able to successfully share your screen. And welcome everybody. I'm so excited to, to have a Great group today and uh, looking forward to continuing to build the movement for clean transportation in New York State together and hear about all of the creative and exciting equitable clean transportation projects that folks are working on. Andy, take it away. Can you see the screen? Can you yep, see the sure shared can. screen? Okay, good, thank you. Um, I'm gonna start with the bad news. Um, an optimistic future totally depends on the will to make it so for clean transportation and for any other plans that we might have. Um, if, should we pursue politics and policy as usual, we're likely to face a grimmer reality, abandoned, flooded, moldering buildings and piers, falling, low-lying sewage treatment plants and electric utilities, climate change and rising sea-driven migrants and clouding, uh, crowding upstate communities. But Post-carbon logistics and wind and solar ships can be part of the solution. The wind has powered vessels for more than 10,000 years and until the mid 19th century it was the only way to transport goods and people over any distance at all. Uh, today in the Hudson, we have two important proof of concept vessels that are proving that we can use the wind and solar. The, the, the schooner Apollonia is a freight sailing vessel that carries Hudson Valley goods uh, to and from New York City. Um, primarily their cargo has been grains and malted barley for beer and distilled spirits, but they've also had um, their first interaction with a a cross oceanic sailing, uh, sailing vessel and consortium called Grain de Sail that's importing chocolates and fine wines and liquors from France. And their last voyage to New York City, the two vessels uh, hooked up in Brooklyn and brought that cargo back to Hudson Valley distributors for those products. 
the the solar passenger vessel Solaris is owned by the Hudson River Maritime Museum. It was built to look like a traditional launch vessel from the 1930s, except it's completely solar powered. It has a ele small electric motor. It is absolutely silent on the water. It's traditionally built at the um, Hudson River Maritime Museum at their wooden boat school uh, with uh, Rondout Woodworking as the uh, lead um, contractors on the boat. It's in its third year of taking people out on the river to educate them about the environment of the river and the opportunities for using solar and alternative energy power for transporting goods and people. Oh, someone called this number? The, um, the, even though we have some ships operating, um, we are looking to the time when we can have more ships operating. And based on the Biden-Harris infrastructure plan, we see that $17 billion is going to go to um, building port infrastructure as well as um, uh, ships and, and um, marine corridors for shipping. And so a part of our plan is to build four proof of concept vessels. These would be locally built from locally sourced and recycled materials, crewed locally with trained mariners, home ported along the Hudson Harbor and the canals. And we're gonna carry locally processed and grown goods from place to place. These are gonna be uh, status quo disruptors. So the, the one, um, there's a 65 foot steel schooner, a 39 foot, uh, what we're calling pickup of the sea that could be built by home builders as well as in small yards. Um, a solar powered, powered uh, canal vessel using the same technology as Solaris and um, a 130 foot ocean going um, solar electric uh, clipper ship that will carry goods from the Caribbean and from Europe to the H Hudson River and the New York metropolitan area back and forth. These ships are built on the idea that during World War II, Liberty ships were built because there was an emergency and we needed ships. These ships are the precursors to uh, Liberty from fossil fuel ships that can be built locally. And, um, and they are gonna be brutally simple to build the way that the Liberty ships during World War II were. Um, these ships are gonna need new ports. Um, sea level rise is slated to be, be two to four feet by mid-century. That means that most of the Hudson River port infrastructure will be underwater, um, including those buildings that now support working waterfronts and recreational waterfronts for that, to, for that matter. So um, the, the center has come up with a plan for Rondout River Port 2040. And this is a plan that takes into account two to four feet of sea level rise, and um, but continues the idea that we can um, continue to have prosperity, not with lower expectations, but with different expectations of the way we live and the way we uh, ship things back and forth. Um, the If you want more information about any of these things, you can contact me at the center, um, Sam Merritt at the Schooner Apollonia, um, Melissa Everett at Sustainable Hudson Valley, Lisa Klein at the Hudson River Maritime Museum, and uh, the Rondout Riverport um, link takes you to um, an article that, that explains the entire project, and I've included my email. Thanks, and I'll be happy to answer questions when it's appropriate. Thanks so much, Andy. That was fantastic. Uh, really exciting to imagine a future with solar powered boats zipping around New York's waterways. Uh, so loved getting a glimpse into what you're already doing and more of what you uh, and your colleagues are planning for the future. Um, so I'm wondering our next speaker, uh, Doug, are you uh, good to go at this point? Let me try. I, I did type in my password. If that worked, it'll work. Otherwise, I'll just talk. That's all I can do. Give it a go. As, as, as we've all become very uh, accustomed to, there 
are often technology glitches in Zoom land. So well, we've learned to roll with the punches, uh, as they say. And I, can't, I can't get it to work. So what okay. I will do is I will just talk and describe my slides. It's frustrating. I went and bought a brand new computer, which uh, I can't seem to get to work on this. Uh, well, that's yeah. okay. No, no worries. I'll, describe my, I'll, I'll just talk. Okay, and, and just so everybody knows, um, Doug uh, is the president of Citizens for Regional Transit based in Buffalo, and he is going to be talking about uh, the expansion of light rail and upstate public transit funding, which I'm sure you're very excited about the infrastructure bill that passed, Doug, and, and all of the money coming to mass transit in New York. So. You've been working on this for a long time and, and would love to hear uh, your thoughts and what you guys have up your sleeves as far as projects are concerned that, that need funding on the ground in Western New York. Okay, thanks, Betta. Uh, I'll just describe my slides. The first slide I had was the, a graphic from the uh, New York State uh, CLCPA committees showing the percentage or the amount of uh, greenhouse gases that come from transportation is dramatic and more than half of that comes from cars. So we really have to fix the car problem and public transit in our opinion is the way to do that. My next slide shows a picture of Buffalo that really illustrates the problem with all the cars. Uh, we have a wonderful waterfront in Buffalo, but when you zoom out, you find out that Buffalo, like a lot of cities, is really a great big parking lot. I got a a chart that's really dramatic. It has red blotches everywhere, which is all the surface parking. And then I've got a, some pictures of the I-190, which goes along our uh, the, the uh, Niagara River to the north, which is also a parking lot much of the time. And we have to get people out of their cars. To do that, we have to make something that's attractive and effective, and buses don't do it. Uh, but Niagara, or Buffalo had, a, the original plan was for a 42 mile light rail network. Uh, we only built six. We're in the process of building another six, so that's encouraging. Uh, but we need to extend that. These light rail trains carry 700 people every 10 minutes uh, capacity. So they're taking a lot of cars off of the road, uh, and they're fast. They go 50 miles an hour versus buses that carry 50 people and go in traffic at a very slow pace. So, you know, our, our approach is to, you know, to have a network that includes buses and light rail. And if you look at some of the issues, there's one highway we have that cuts through one of our low income neighborhoods. Uh, it, carries, it carries about uh, 60,000 cars a day, peak of 8,000. The only way to get that many people off of, out of their cars is with light rail, it's fast and it carries enough people to do that. And I had a graphic that kind of showed that. I also have another graphic that's uh, quite dramatic. I wish I could show it to people. Well, Doug, showed... maybe, you know, I. You're teasing us with these great graphics we can't see. Um, you know, we can share the slides with everybody after so they can check them out. Um, I think just, yeah, sharing your, your thoughts and, and we can definitely be sure to distribute uh, the slides of, of all of our speakers after the event. Yep, I, I will do that. I'll get the slides to you better and Perfect. they'll be on our, our website as well. So yeah, I'm very anxious to share our, share our graphics. Uh, the one that I'm describing now shows, you know, one train versus all the cars that it can replace every 10 minutes. It's really dramatic and it's really the way to go. Uh, if you look at the Buffalo um, Metro and the Buffalo Transit System, the let, right now we have a six mile long let, light rail system and over a thousand miles of buses, but that six miles of light rail carries 20% of the uh, NFTA transit passengers. Uh, the other slide I've got, uh, again, I will be sharing this, uh, uh, it shows a picture. I mean, the, there's a lot of push and a lot of thought that the way to solve the problem is just to everyone just start driving electric cars. And we don't think that's gonna work. It doesn't work in, uh, in, certainly in urban areas like Buffalo and New York City, uh, because you still have the congestion, you still have all the parking, all the roads, you know, every ton of concrete generates a ton of CO2. So if you gotta keep building parking lots and roads and repairing them for all the cars, you know, it just creates more pollution. Uh, my graphic shows a picture of a bunch of tires, worn out tires, uh, that uh, we've got over, we've got billions of them already in landfills and in storage areas. We don't know what to do with them. Uh, we're creating millions and millions and millions every year. Uh, and, and it's just a big, big problem. And in addition to that, 
It's not just the worn out tires we don't know what to do with, but the process of wearing them out is a big problem for the environment as well. It generates uh, uh, microplastics, which get into the environment, into the soil, streams, waterways. It even gets airbound, air, airborne, and it has been found even in the Arctic and Antarctic, and that can actually get uh, darken the snow cover and, and create some climate issues with absorbing uh, energy from the sun. So it's a huge problem. Cars are not going to be the solution. We need cars for suburban areas and for you know, rural areas, but in our metro areas, our met, in our urban areas like Buffalo, uh, we need an efficient mass transit system like light rail. In Buffalo, we're fortunate we already have a light rail system. We just need to expand it. So my conclusion and I, my concluding slide is just basically saying that we need to reduce vehicle miles traveled by providing an attractive high capacity uh, transit system. Uh, so our proposal is uh, provide funding. And again, it, it, with the TCI or whatever source of ongoing funding we, we end up finding to solve this problem, we see that being applied to uh, to operations and maintenance, because that's the problem. We don't have enough money to keep, to provide really good public transit. So we're we're calling for the uh, the TCI funds or whatever funding, operational ongoing funding uh, be applied to statewide, but also in Buffalo to uh, to support public transit and make it, make it attractive and effective uh, and as effective as cars and attractive as cars as well. Uh, and also to help us uh, with our local share for extending uh, Buffalo Light Rail uh, from the federal money, federal money, so the 50% uh, share, which is that, which is another problem I was going to just mention real quickly. The problem that we need to solve is that the um, federal transit money uh, is shared 50-50, but highway transit money is shared 80-20. So, uh, so for highways, there's only 20% local share, which is easier to come to. So it provides, a, it makes a bias against public transportation when federal money is applied to projects. So we want to see that changed. And that's my presentation. Uh, again, I'll have any, take any questions uh, when, uh, whenever appropriate. Uh, and I will get these slides to you better so you can share them. Fantastic, Doug. And you were able to paint a picture for us. And I think we still get a really good sense of some of the challenges uh, with relying just on EVs. Although I love my EV, uh, I also love uh, mass transit and know how essential it is that we scale up and really invest and appreciate all of the good work uh, that you and the folks at Citizens for Regional Transit have been doing all these years. And I just noticed that you have some boats in your background and coming off of Andy's presentation, I'm just imagining some little solar panels on those, uh, <laughs> those model boats. Very cool. Um, so thank you so much. And I think, you know, we're going to be getting into with our coalition or our campaign and my for TC um, we're going to really be shifting gears and, and focusing on how to leverage that federal money so it does go to mass transit and to the great projects that we want to see. So appreciate you teeing that up for us um, for future conversations and, and for the work that we have ahead. Um, so next up, we have uh, Nina Orville, who is the Executive Director of Sustainable Westchester. And Nina, a longtime uh, advocate for a greener Westchester and world, uh, is going to be sharing some very exciting news on an on-demand electric paratransit pilot project that is in the works and, and maybe some other thoughts about um, what you have going in, in the greater Westchester area, Nina. Uh, please take it away. Thank and you, Betta. Um, so briefly, Sustainable Westchester is a nonprofit consortium of 45 municipalities in Westchester County. We have a range of different clean energy programs, um, clean transportation being one of them. Within the area of clean transportation, um, a lot of our work has been focused on bringing EV charging infrastructure to our municipal members. Um, we've helped our municipalities um, apply for, and in many cases um, secure already, funding for uh, about 300 charging ports um, that will be installed uh, throughout the county. 
uh, we still need to, to do, do work um, across the state to address tariffs for charging vehicles. It's particularly important for people who live in multifamily housing who have to use um, charging infrastructure um, that, that might be billed um, uh, different rates than if they, they had their own um, charging um, uh, equipment. So what I'm going to talk about briefly is a, a project that we have been working with Westchester County, um, a company called VIA, and the city of Peekskill um, on. And um, this is a, a project that we are pursuing funding for on a pilot basis to bring on-demand electric mobility solutions to the city of Peekskill. And um, Peekskill was selected for this uh, particular project for a number of reasons. In, in the city of Peekskill, um, most households have either um, one car or no cars. And at the same time, there are only about um, a fifth as many jobs located in the city of Peekskill as there are residents. So that means that residents have to commute in order to, to access job opportunities. And um, so the solution that we are proposing with our partners provides an enhancement to the existing transit system by offering on-demand transit that links with Westchester County's Beeline bus network, which is the second largest uh, bus system in, in New York State. And um, the on-demand fleet is, um, will be fully electric. And that also provides the opportunity to build out the charging infrastructure in the city of Peekskill, even beyond the needs for this particular fleet, um, it provides the opportunity to, to think about the charging infrastructure required um, to meet the, the needs of people who don't live in single family housing, who um, can't um, easily have their own um, chargers. Uh, and the, so the, this project is designed to increase um, the number of jobs that are, will be accessible to residents in the city of Peekskill within a 45 minute commute, to increase utilization of the existing transit system without adding to, to emissions, which is really important in the city of, of Peekskill. Um, this is a, a program that would serve as a pilot in Westchester County. Um, Westchester is interested in uh, considering a number of other municipalities throughout the county for this, particularly with a focus on disadvantaged communities. And um, so we're, we're very excited at the opportunity um, hopefully to to roll this to roll this out. And I'm happy to answer any questions later when we get to questions. Thanks so much, Nina. I'm really excited about that uh, project also and uh, have to admit that uh, Ulster County is also working on a partnership uh, with VIA. And, and hopefully we're going, and I put a link in the chat uh, to the website ridewithvia.com because it's such an innovative, cool concept that encourages mass transit, but also acknowledges that you need that, um, you know, on-demand service oftentimes to really reach all of the people who, who need a lift and they need it in a timely fashion. And, and especially when, you know, you have more kind of suburban sprawl, rural areas, um, 
you know, it's, it's a different animal than, than mass transit in the cities. And it seems like this whole via on demand, um, you know, electric paratransit concept is, is addressing that issue. And so it's very exciting to see. And as always, Sustainable Westchester is leading the charge on these cool projects. So thank you so much for sharing that. Um, and I probably have a lot of interest from people who want to hear about um, how they can bring this to their community. Um, so next up, we have uh, a little bit down uh, down the river, Hudson River, uh, <laughs> Mariah O'Crongley uh, from Bedford 2030 is going to be uh, talking about uh, electric school buses and some other cool clean transportation work uh, that they're doing. So Mariah, uh, thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much. Let me just share my screen. All right, so my name is Mariah O'Crongley. I am one of the program directors at Bedford 2030, which is a grassroots environmental organization in the town of Bedford, which is a community of a little less than 20,000 people. Bedford 2030 was started in 2010 by a group of really three progressive women who wanted to do something for our community and the environment. And we've made significant strides in greenhouse gas reduction. In 2020, we rebranded in 2020 to be Bedford 2030. And now we have a really aggressive goal of 80% reduction by 2030. And the three areas we're focusing on in these next 10 years are transportation buildings and um, climate drawdown using our natural resources to absorb greenhouse gas emissions. In the area of transportation, one of the big um, projects we're working on right now is our quest for electric school buses. And we've spent a lot of time over the last couple months talking to electric bus companies, other communities that have managed to get electric buses, um, looking at different companies that provide, provide uh, there's a company called Highland that will provide the infrastructure to employ electric buses without putting a lot of the work burden on communities. Um, so with all that research, we determined that our goal was to uh, start small, to get each of our school districts to add a bond proposition for one electric bus in the next school year as a way to demonstrate the feasibility of the technology, reduce the range anxiety, the charging anxieties that uh, a, lot of, a lot of communities have shared that their community members or school boards have expressed. Um, with that goal, we created a petition in the town of Bedford, which I will share the link. And we've been working with within our community and with local community organizations to publicize the petition and get signatures. We have about a thousand signatures now. And then with those signatures, we've recently reached out to the school districts to communicate with them what our hopes are, what our goals are, and trying to work with them to create a long-term plan, not only for electrifying the school buses, but just transportation in general, because thinking about school transportation, it's not only the buses bringing students there, it's also the teachers that are commuting to the school and making sure the schools have the appropriate charging infrastructure. So while we, we think we've made, uh, we've made pretty good progress so far, and we believe at least one of the school districts in the next bond proposition will include an electric school bus, it is definitely a journey, the, the school bus route, especially because it's such a new, it's considered a very new technology and the concept of using the buses to feed the grid with the vehicle to grid technology is all it's all very new, um, so so it definitely is a long a long haul initiative, but worthwhile. And I think with the new infrastructure bill and all the funds associated with that, there's going to be a bigger push to move forward with this. So I think it's a it's a prime time if if you're considering this to um, to begin the process. A couple helpful things in our our research, our petition is one the community Croton on Hudson. There, that group has done an incredible amount of work and they've actually built a tool that you can put in all the info, inputs from your community and see, okay, how much will this bus actually cost? Which is a pretty powerful tool. It, I think, weeds through a lot of the what ifs, what ifs, and actually just gives black and white facts. And I'm happy to share that tool that they created. I can't take credit for it, but they created that's useful for other communities. And we also have a, a FAQ that we spent a lot of time developing on our website 
that dispels a lot of the myths that are commonly associated with electric school buses. And I'd be happy to share that link with communities as well. One other initiative that we did this year that I think uh, was really successful and would be great in, in other communities is we did a National Drive Electric Week event. And when you register an event with National Drive Electric Week, they provide, um, you can apply for funding and they provide a lot of marketing materials. So we had a big event in Bedford, 300 people attended. We had an electric school bus there that uh, White Plains was kind enough to lend to us. We just paid for the cost of electricity to charge it um, that we, we had brought up. And I think it was a great way for the community to see not only different owners who have electric cars, dealers who are selling electric cars, but people could actually go on to an electric school bus, walk on and see it's just like a regular school bus, except it's good for the environment. Happy to take any questions, share any links, resources as we've gone through this process in our community. Wow, that's amazing. Um, I have in-person event envy, Mariah, that you had 300 people at your <laughs> Drive Electric Week event. That sounds so cool um, and very exciting to hear about all of the great progress that you're making um, with electric school buses in, in Bedford and, and Croton. And I think we would love to learn more about the tool uh, that you mentioned and we can circulate that. And I know that, you know, there's various efforts, uh, including on the legislative front uh, to expand uh, electric school buses in New York. This is, as you put it, um, the beginning of a long journey, um, but we'll get there because it is the right thing to do. It's, it's necessary for our kids' health and for our planet and, and so important and fantastic that you're working on it. So thank you. Um, and, and next up, we have another, uh, another Bedford or in the neighborhood of Bedford and, and lower Hudson Valley, um, which, you know, there's a lot of great projects happening across the state. Uh, but this was a, a collaborative effort of our NY for TCI crew, which has folks all across the state. And it just happened that we had this concentration of, of some um, great projects that we wanted to highlight in the, in the Hudson Valley, Westchester area. Um, but we're working our way geographically around the state. And we also have a map. Um, that we'll put in the chat that people can check out showing some of the projects that we didn't get to today. And also we want to uh, continue to build the map and hear from you what projects in your community you wanna see identified on the map and also uh, projects more importantly that you wanna see funded. Um, so next up, we have another great project, uh, Bridget Griswold, who is the executive director of Groundwork Hudson Valley who will be presenting on the Yonkers Greenway. Uh, Bridget, very excited to hear uh, how this Greenway is going to connect folks also to public transit. So not only um, promoting biking and walking, um, but also bringing people to uh, the MTA, I believe. So uh, please, uh, let's hear what's going on in, in Yonkers and beyond. Oh, wait, we can't hear you. <laughs> got to unmute. Unmute. Okay, I'm on mute. Great. We got you. And I'm pulling up my slide. Um, so um, I'm the executive director at Grammar Cuts and Valley. We are an environmental justice group based in Yonkers. And I'm uh, here to talk about a project called the Yonkers Greenway, which has been 13 years in the making. Um, one of the things that I love most about this project and probably one of the reasons it's taken so long to bring to fruition is that this was really a, a, a bottom up and not top down initiative um, and wasn't actually conceived of originally as a greenway as the final goal and vision. So um, Groundwork does a lot of work in the areas of Southwest Yonkers um, where there has been a lot of historical environmental injustices done a lot of low and moderate income communities uh, live on this side of town. And oftentimes we get asked to participate in community cleanups. And the Lawrence Street area, in particular of Yonkers, uh, Grandma was asked to get involved in a cleanup um, around a vacant lot um, where there has been significant dumping, 
crime and illicit drug activity. And the local community members ask us to get involved. Uh, we got involved through basic trash pickups and cleanups um, until our community started to recognize that there was a pattern in these vacant lots where we were doing these cleanups and that the vacant lots were actually linear in nature. And so we embarked on further research to understand that what we were looking at wasn't a series of vacant lots. It was the former route of an abandoned railroad known as the Putnam Railroad, which for those of you familiar um, with this railroad it used to run from New York City all the way up to Brewster um, and was discontinued back in the 1940s uh, when the rail was electrified. Um, that railroad was shut down, but its route um, in, in parts of Westchester became the South County Trail and the North County Trail that I, I know many of our Westchester residents um, love to visit. But a piece of the old railroad was completely forgotten, a 2.2 mile route that was a spur off the main line uh, that ran from New York City to downtown Yonkers. And so we got involved with thinking about how we could convert these series of vacant lots into um, a green, um, bike and, and walking pathway to reconnect downtown Yonkers with New York City once again. And so, um, again, it took quite a, a long time to bring this to fruition because it involved a lot of community meetings and charrettes to get impact from lo in input from local residents around what they wanted to see in this vision moving forward and wasn't originally conceived as a green solution. Our residents were looking for answers to crime that was going on in their neighborhoods. They were looking for ways to revitalize economic activity in the neighborhoods there where businesses would shuttered after the, after the railroad was discontinued. Um, and finally, looking for places for their children to play that would be safe. So um, the design um, and conceptual designs were completed, a feasibility study um, done back in 2015 and the city got involved. This is now officially a city of Yonkers project. Um, and they have um, won a state grant from the New York Transportation Authority to move this from conception to reality. Phase one of the project has actually been completed. If you see the picture on the bottom right, that is where the old train station used to, that's a picture of the old train station. Um, that was abandoned and became this very dangerous vacant lot. And so we went through a series of community charrettes. We involved the local community school from school 13, asked them what they wanted to see in this space, as well as seniors from the municipal housing, which is adjacent to this vacant lot. And seniors wanted to see a community garden. So we built a community garden and the kids of course wanted to see the lot former train station converted into a park where they could play and they picked out the most expensive play equipment. We had to get special ordered and shipped down to Yonkers um, to create what is now a brand new park. Um, and the, the second phase of it, which um, will be funded by the Transportation um, Alternatives um, State Grant, as well as bonds that the city has committed to this, um, will be uh, breaking ground and completed next year. When it is completed, it will be a 15 minute bike ride from downtown Yonkers into Manhattan. And I appreciate uh, Betta you raising the point that we were also looking at connectivity to other public transit. So the Metro North um, Railroad in downtown Yonkers, the Greenway will connect with, as well as looking at bus stops along the B line where people might be able to get off the Greenway. They wanna take a bus somewhere um, and get back on later on. Um, as well as the New York City subway system. So when this is done, it will connect with the 242nd Street um, subway stop in the Bronx. It's a pretty exciting project. And one other thing that I will notice about um, what I'm most excited about is that if you look at the little um, picture in the middle of the slide there, those red areas are, are part of a study that Groundwork has completed, looking at where the most extreme urban heat island effects are going to be impacting our community. Um, and so we're looking at ways that this could also be used as a climate mitigation strategy, where we could use implement green infrastructure solutions along the route of this greenway, more trees, more shade canopy. Um, and if you look at that route, it goes right through the hottest areas of downtown Yonkers. So we kind of see this as a multi-purpose 
um, initiative that can help um, do several things, um, connect existing public transit systems, reduce crime overall with more people using this trail, um, encouraging economic development so more mom and pop businesses, bike repair shops in this particular neighborhood that really needs more business investment. Um, and finally, as I mentioned, a real climate adapt adaptation strategy beyond just getting cars off the road and encourage people to walk and bike more, but also the actual infrastructure of the trail could be used to help abate some of these extreme heat issues that we're seeing um, happen more frequently due to climate change. Um, finally, I have a list of the funding sources that are supporting this project on the right. That's just where I'd like to leave, uh, finish off with one last point, which is I'm also really surprised and excited about the number of different funders that have been attracted to this project, not just our city government, but our federal government, as well as state government, as well as corporate and foundation supporters have all found a way to, to chip in and help finance this thing, which right now we're looking at um, about 7.5 million uh, to bring this project to fruition. So thank you for uh, listening. And I'm also here um, to answer any questions when appropriate. Thank you, Bridget. What an exciting project. Uh, somebody put in the chat, this is an amazing reuse project. And yes, I, I couldn't agree more. Um, it's really fantastic to see the work that you've been doing. And this is a perfect example of a community driven development project. Uh, your years of bringing folks together to get their input, to reflect what the community's needs are, and, and even thinking, you know, in a more kind of futuristic, resilient sense, taking into account, um, you know, the heat islands and, and all of that. It's really incredible to see such a holistic approach uh, being utilized by, um, by you all in this project. So excited to see how it continues to evolve and, and I'm sure people will have questions for you. Um, so while we're on the subject of greenways, uh, we have another greenway uh, that we wanted to share with you all. Uh, Ibrahim Abdul-Mateen is going to be uh, talking a little bit about the Brooklyn Queens Greenway, which is in the works uh, a little down the river. And, and I think another project as well um, that you've been involved with somehow, Ibrahim, the um, electric bike uh, initiative. So uh, yeah, tell, tell us what's going on uh, in the city. So I'm just gonna first, I'm, uh, thank you so much, Beta and Bridget, that was awesome. I think you're the, just showing the connectivity of you know, Westchester into the city, it just, it's just really encouraging. I put in the chat a um, link to the BGI, the Brooklyn Greenway Initiative. They have a map um, that shows the connectivity of their network. And I'll just give you some context before I, I jump to the slide. It's 26 miles of protected and landscaped route. And it's gonna ring around Brooklyn. You can see it's gonna connect waterfront, parks, open space, commercial, industrial, and cultural areas. What I think is amazing about this and which connects to the other Greenway examples that were shared is that this is a whole new type of infrastructure. It's basic, but it's funny that it's almost an old type of infrastructure. Because if you look at the efforts of like Olmsted and Vox and some of the early planners, they, they similarly, they created Greenways that stretch outside of parks to stretch parks outside of their park spaces to, to pull greenways outside. They did that so they could sort of infuse residents with, with um, trees and wildlife and that sort of thing. But we're essentially doing that now to reconnect and create a whole different type of, of green space, a whole different type of infrastructure, a whole different type, different type of transportation infrastructure. So in many ways, what we're, gonna, what we're talking about is that um, there's 2.65 million residents in Brooklyn, 1.1 employees, people that come to Brooklyn to enjoy this and 15 million annual visitors. So those, that's the sort of scale of people that are gonna be using this infrastructure and getting access. It creates habitats and co-benefits. But what I wanted to share was not necessarily about the Green, Brooklyn Greenway because the Brooklyn Greenway is, is part of an, a larger effort that's looking at, um, uh, sorry, you guys see this? Yeah, um, it's looking at 
greenways for New York City altogether. And I think there's a larger effort in general to create a much more connected um, city all across the board. Now there's a lot of sort of reasons why we want this. And there's a lot of greenways around the city already. We want new options for people to, to move around based on COVID. We don't know what the sort of reality is gonna bring. A lot of people don't necessarily feel safe or comfortable in the subways. A lot of people live far from where they work and they have to travel to like a traditional true fare zone where you have to get on a bus to a train or a train to a bus just to get to your to place of work or to see your family members. And there's a lot of routes that are happening outside of just the Brooklyn to Manhattan route. There's Brooklyn to other parts of Brooklyn and Brooklyn to other parts of Queens. Those routes we need to account for. We also need to create protected lanes and protected areas for people of all ages and all abilities. I always like to say is, if you're thinking about building a bike lane or, or a protected bike uh, air, area, can my mother, who's just now cracking into her 70s, can she hop on a bike and feel safe and comfortable doing so? That's crucial. And as you mentioned earlier, Bridget, it's about our resiliency and, and about our overall preparing for the next 50 to 100 years in the city that we don't actually know exactly how that's gonna impact our transportation system. Um, so that just gives like a view now, all over the there's there's projects all over the city. So there's projects in every borough where there's a lot of work that needs to be done. Now, I like to show this side because it shows that there's actually there's not only is there work happening and there's connectivity and pieces of it. And I'm going to show you on a, a, a picture on later. But this is an opportunity for for jobs because one of the co benefits of these things is um, green infrastructure projects. There's a whole green infrastructure emphasis where you're sort of peeling back the layer of concrete and what we've pressed onto the natural world in our city and letting the water seep into the ground as it did in historical times, in ancient times, we're sort of excavating that and, re and revealing that um, um, and making that possible again. But also when we build these protected bike lanes and we build these areas, you're going to need people to do that work. You're going to need people that are local to do that work. And I think this is a great um, co-benefit co of this as well. Um, so obviously we know about the federal government working on, on these, um, there's, there's actually some good news that's coming from the um, Build Back Better bill. There's um, funding within the neighborhood and access and equity grants. There's also funding within um, community climate incentives. So there's pots of funding. We can talk more about that when we do the um, Q and A, but there's actually pots of money that are available right now that are, or that will be available that because people see the value of it. Now, some of you know that I'm also on the New York State Advisory Board for the Trust for Public Land. One of the reasons why I like the Trust for Public Land is that we have put together a slate of projects in New York State, but also around the country. And almost every initiative that the TPL was part of to help conserve and protect um, natural areas was supported by left and right, Republican and, and Democrat, liberal and conservative. So when you create more green space, you create more open space and you connect them, that is, a, that is actually the best bipartisan effort and things you could possibly do. This is not an upstate downstate issue. It becomes upstate downstate when you connect the dots and you connect the infrastructure. Then it becomes actually the connective tissue for the city, the same way the trains traditionally were when they went from downstate to upstate before we got, became a car centric place. This is a list of all of the projects that are in development. And if you look here, there's, there's a lot of effort that's already been put in place. The Brooklyn Waterfront Greenway Initiative has a lot of very specific projects that are, that are underway that need some effort and some energy and some, some focus. And that's what I'm excited to, to talk about um, is really is making sure that these things happen, but also seeing the larger picture. It's not just the small, and I, I think actually what's encouraging about this conversation today for everybody who hopped on this is that not only, I was excited to talk about the Brooklyn Greenway Initiative, but if you think about the Brooklyn Greenway Initiative, you have to think about the New York City Greenways. If you think about New York City Greenways, you have to think about its relationship to Long Island, which we'll come to, and then also Westchester County. And that extends all the way throughout. And I think it's a really um, absolutely encouraging um, to see that there's a lot of effort. The last thing I wanna share is um, a project. Can you guys see this? Mm, no, I don't see it. I see like a little white square. Oh, sorry. Well, there's an effort called, um, here, I'll stop sharing. And then uh, there's a, the Equitable Commute Project. It's a um, project that I've been working on for um, 
some time as a part of a, our um, work through um, NYU. We've been looking at ideas and projects where it re requires um, public, private, and civic partnership to execute. Much like a lot of the projects that are mentioned in here, if we bring all the sectors together to rally around really good ideas, the equitable ep ECP or the Equitable Commute Project is a partnership between transportation alternatives, Electric Avenue, the HOPE program, and Spring, Brank, Spring Bank in the Bronx, which is providing some of the funding. Essentially what we're doing is giving, and there's a, pro there's a distribution, and I'll put the flyer into the uh, chat after I'm done with talking. There's a distribution of giving, uh, our initial distribution of giving 15 um, e-bikes and e-scooters um, that'll be given from Van Moof, um, Zumo, Rad Power, uh, Ride Panda. We're giving those to frontline workers in New York City. These are healthcare workers. These are folks that are doulas. These are folks that really do like essential work. Our vision was to give out 10,000 e-bikes and e-scooters around across the city to connect the tissue, to, um, to bring those people to those, that connective tissue of all that, of uh, the bike infrastructure that we described. But really, I think this is a lot of the future. We have to transform not only the physical way we think about infrastructure, but we also have to make sure that we give people the, the vehicles and the, the ways to do that. What I like about this project too, is that we're not leasing them. We're not get, letting people rent them. We're not letting people use them. We're giving them away. And that's where we got the funding and um, to make sure that people could own these e-bikes and, and e-scooters um, so that in the future, that'll be a critical part of our infrastructure. So I'll shut up for now. I'll put some chat, I'll put some links in the chat. Um, I appreciate the opportunity better. That's fantastic, Ibrahim. Thank you so much for sharing that. And I should have said, uh, we are very grateful uh, to have you as a senior Clean Power Fellow and helping us to stay connected to so many of these great cutting edge projects and people. So appreciate all that you do and uh, really cool to hear about um, those e-bikes being given away. And of course, uh, this growing movement for greenways in NYC. Uh, so we have a couple more speakers left. We are taking a tour around the state here and, and we're still in the city, in New York City, I should say. And uh, next up, we have um, a Southeast Queens member of New York Communities for Change, which is part of NY for TCI. Uh, Jean Sassine, we are so happy to have you join. And I love that you're walking around in the street, bringing some action to Zoom land here. Uh, Jean, welcome. Thank you. Uh, and I'll, I'll pass it off to you. Oh, we got to unmute though. Yep. There you go. Hi. Thank you. <laughs> um, caught me here at work. We're outside here uh, uh, wrapping our, our pantry, pantry work here in. Uh, I'm actually in, in Brooklyn, but um, as a, a resident of the Southeast Queens, Queens Village, Laurelton, Rosedale, uh, Hollis, uh, I'll be brief. Um, I'm very excited about all the projects I've, I've heard. Oh, we're starting to lose you a little bit. <laughs> yeah, on the, on the... Okay, there was, yeah, we got you. Oh, okay. So I was saying that I think one thing that was set it off in Queens uh, from all the projects that I've been excited, excitedly listening to is uh, the on-demand uh, uh, electric uh, vehicles would be uh, so swell. You know, here in Southeast Queens, we're a two fare zone. So even though we don't actually pay two fares anymore, we still have to, most of us still have to take a bus to the train, to the subway to get to work. So, uh, the, right now, the city is trying to uh, remove buses from us, uh, even though at the same time, we're also trying to get them to uh, uh, replace the fleet with electric buses. But it seems counterproductive to take away our service, right, when the population is just growing, right? Uh, Southeast Queens is where you heard all of those uh, folks uh, in need of affordable everything. Uh, you know, unfortunately, all those folks that uh, that drowned in the, the last, you know, bad storm we had is just tells you what kind of infrastructure we need. Thank you, sir. Yes. What kind of infrastructure we need built out here. Um, so living in a two fare zone, uh, we just need more buses, but we need more electric buses because just as, uh, was it um, uh, 
Buffalo's uh, uh, Greenway that, uh, or is it Bedford that, you know, most of the, the, the pollution is coming from cars. We're kind of, Queens is built kind of uh, with the idea of that old sprawl mentality. So we're either driving or, you know, waiting for buses, like accessory ride is insufficient. So we would need more electric, more, uh, more bus uh, service, more transit service. All right. All right, I'm on a Zoom right now. So, um, so unfortunately, that's uh, most of our testimony is that we are in need of more transit service and increased routes, not decreasing routes. And we need, because of uh, our growing denseness in, popu in population, we need more electric service, uh, more green service, as opposed to as opposed to more carbon, you know, as opposed to the, the, the carbon base that they're trying to, to cut down on us, right? Because more people need to move around, not less. Absolutely, yes. <laughs> and appreciate that you're on the ground uh, fighting for more and better bus service with New York Communities for Change. Uh, I have no doubt that you will win uh, for Southeast Queens and, and beyond uh, and, and really appreciate your passion and energy and all of the great work you're doing as a community activist. Uh, so thank you so much, Jean. And I hope you'll stay connected with us and, and let us know what we can do to help support your fight on the ground uh, for more and better bus service. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, definitely be in touch and I am just so excited by and what really another thing that really excites me is that all the connectivity between all these projects right it's not just like one silo here one silo there but they're all reaching out you know someone's going to come out from 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 uh uh upstate north down to Yonkers and then from Yonkers is going to connect to the Bronx and then you know that transit system is going to reach out and connect you know with us in Queens so it it It'll be a, a broad-based impact and not like silos of, uh, 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 you know, it's not going to be like uh, uh, Campbell Soup in Camden, right? Just one little silo of prosperity in the middle uh, of the desert. Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. We need to come together as New Yorkers across the state and really fight for equitable, clean transportation projects and, and make sure that we're supporting each other and, and not competing for the resources, but helping to, to collaborate and to cooperate so that um, our communities get the kind of uh, services that they need. For sure. Well, if the governor sign, you know, signs this on, it's, it's a no-brainer for a pot of money that's waiting to be collected, there'd, there'd be no need to compete for that. Well, there you go. Yes, with TCI, I mean, some estimates are that we'd get a billion dollars a year um, if TCI was adopted in New York, which would be really amazing. Um, and, and I know that there will be money in the short term coming uh, through the infrastructure bill that was passed, but we need a long-term solution and we need to cut uh, pollution coming from the sector, um, you know, as you pointed out. You know, I plan, I plan to be here in 2050 to see if I have grandkids. And so I can't tell my, my, my children, you know, in 2030, well, you know, we dropped the ball back then. You know, you all just have to wear like gas masks, uh, you know, to, the, to, to your wedding. No, we definitely want to create a cleaner, greener future for our kids and our grandkids and uh, future generations beyond that. So um we got to keep up the fight and uh and gl glad and grateful that that you're there on the front lines gene so thank you so much for being here um and we actually um speaking of moving around the state uh we have we we wouldn't want to forget long island uh we never some people want to that. forget long island it's all right From buffalo <laughs> to long island uh so western new york all the way out to the island um eric alexander uh the director of vision long island uh thank you for being here uh we're looking forward uh to hearing from you last but definitely not least uh present on some downtown traffic calming projects in long island um, and yeah, I know that you guys have been working on smart growth and, um, going back to Ibrahim's point about, you know, sort of this more holistic approach to development, uh, and, and moving away from car culture, but at the same time, acknowledging where we are and, and what you guys are facing out on Long Island, which I believe has the 
largest source of greenhouse gas emissions in the transportation sector um, in the state, I believe. Uh, but anyway. Yeah, no, we've, we've reduced some of them in recent, in, in recent well, times. Anyway, so no, thank you, Betta, for, 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 uh, for putting this together. A great round of presentations, in particular the last two I really enjoyed that are really talking about connecting to people on the street. And I, I think that's incredibly valuable. That's what we try to do out here on the island. I also have Alyssa Kyle is on with me who may just join for a minute to, to jump in on something, on, on part of my presentation. I'll try to be brief. I know folks have been listening uh, to a lot of great stuff, but I know there's a lot to cover. So we've been around 25 years, Vision Long Island. We have a Main Street Alliance. We also have a Complete Streets Coalition. We've been doing these complete street summits for a dozen years. Basically, the purpose is really to get more traffic calming projects, more people walking, biking. That's really the focus primarily for us. We've done 15 walking audits with AARP, been a great partnership to really get on the street and connect to see how to physically change the conditions. You know, Long Island's interesting. We have about 100 communities, but about 50 functioning downtowns. So we're a community of communities. We don't really see ourselves as a region. Nobody likes to talk about regional anything. So people really connect out here on a community level and we got to get to people on that level. Um, so, you know, we got some of the most dangerous roadways. That's some of the real big challenge. Uh, we're always on the top as far as dangerous roadways. There is a car culture, um, you know, and, and only we, the only solution we were getting in recent years is these cameras, you know, which really have not, you know, we're really trying to focus on the physical design of the roadways, uh, you know, so we get these uh, uh, red light cameras, which, which aren't popular, but and, and don't always bring the dollars back into the traffic calming projects that we need. So we need physical design changes. Where are we recently? Uh, you know, the exodus from the city has in a, and benefited us in a way. There's been increase in walking and biking post coronavirus. Uh, we've got 30 downtowns to do outdoor dining uh, and uh, have closed down streets uh, for that kind of public space dynamic, which is really eating into car culture in a good way. Um, we got 45 downtowns with these revitalization projects that includes uh, transit-oriented development, more housing, more affordable housing. We've got about 15,000 units of transit-oriented development built around our downtowns in recent years. So that's all good news. Um, there has been a brief reduction of VMTs, uh, vehicle miles traveled during the pandemic. Um, and, you know, on our, our bus systems have kind of held their own as far as ridership, which is great. There's been a couple shifts to electric buses in Nassau and in Suffolk, which is great. So those are those are good news. Our Long Island Railroad usage is uh, only at 50 percent. So we have, you know, a lot of that's a function of what's happening in Manhattan. But a lot of that is folks more working from home. So we're adapting to that shift. Uh, so. You know, while we're doing all those things, um, I just want to explain why. I know we've heard a lot of range of different presentations here today. Alyssa, can you jump on and just give us it in a better way than I could ever describe uh, kind of our reason why we're, our approach is what it is? Yeah, I mean, I guess Long Island being the general car culture that we have here, everyone, when they talk about clean transportation, everyone just thinks electric vehicles. Um, and we kind of well, that's a part of the solution, obviously, as was mentioned earlier, you know, there's still a lot of environmental issues with uh, car usage, regardless of what's powering them. Um, in addition to like the concrete and the tires and stuff, I mean, there's, there's a, a human component that isn't addressed by just switching fuels, whether it's traffic and the noise pollution associated with that, the crashes, we have some of the most deadly roads for pedestrians and cyclists. Um, you know, and just, you know, just reduced physical activity, you know, when you drive everywhere, you know, we have nationally high obesity rates and everything else. And so, you know, so that only deals with a, a portion of it. So we're really trying to focus on, you know, the, the most energy efficient ways of getting around, which is by bike and walking. Um, and, you know, because every trip you do start out on your feet, you don't, you know, you don't roll out of bed into your car. So you, at some point you're walking anyway. So trying to make those conditions better um, to encourage walking, you know, the, talk about walkability, but trying, trying to get it to another level is a concept called walk appeal um, that was coined by an architect, Steve Muzan, but it's, it's not just making it where you can able to walk, but appealing, because if you're going to encourage people to get out of their cars, it has to be, you know, better than driving someplace. So, you know, how do you create those conditions? And a lot of it is reducing speed with traffic coming, because the faster the cars are moving, the more dangerous it is, the more unpleasant it is. It's just, you know, you know, it, it, even if you could walk there, you're not going to choose to walk there just because it's it's not a place you want to be. 
Um, so we focus mostly in the downtown. So a lot of it is, you know, narrowing of lanes, bringing bike lanes into the downtowns, um, surrounding neighborhoods, which is kind of like a, the next phase, I guess, is, is looking at how to get those neighborhoods surrounding our downtowns to be more walkable. So folks who live maybe three quarters of a mile away are walking to Main Street rather than, you know, driving and then looking for a parking spot because, you know, if you ask most people what's the biggest problem downtown, they'll say there's not enough parking, <laughs> you know, even though that's not the only way to get there, but that's the first thing that people think of. Um, so, yeah, so, you know, you know, DOTs, you know, have always wanted to make roads wider. So, you know, we're, we're trying to like, you know, cut that back and pull things in and bring the edges back in to, you know, make the lanes narrower, use some of that space for, you know, in the downtowns, a lot of it, we did a lot of parking lanes converted to outdoor dining, which obviously was done in the city and other places. But I think people finally got to see that, you know, hey, maybe filling up every inch of pavement with cars is not the best way to use it, especially in our downtown, and that people like to have that human activity. Um, so, you know, just try, you know, trying to make them, you know, make our downtowns, you know, the more walkable that are, the more economically productive, they're safer, they're healthier, and they're just more human environments, um, you know, places for people where, you know, people can be healthy and, and you know, enjoy interacting with others. Um, so I'm just trying to see if I've missed anything, but, you know, just, you know, there's different, you know, we're using, looking at different techniques, whether it's in the downtown or in a surrounding neighborhood on an arterial road, maybe that leads you to a downtown might require something different, like protected bike lanes, whereas, you know, on a smaller grid of streets, maybe you can, you know, address the issue differently. So we're looking at, you know, different communities, different solutions for different types of roads. So it's, you know, it's, it's not a single project. We're looking at there's many not, levels of many. Uh, <laughs> there's not one, there's not one, there's no one strategy on Long Island that's going to work. There's no right. one universal truth, you know, though speed reduction is one of the keys. Um, so, I mean, thank you, Alyssa. And just so just to wrap up, I mean, um, you know, moving forward, so there's been about 40 traffic calming projects through the years that we've endorsed and have gotten constructed. There's about 20 more communities that have proposals in the hopper. So we're hoping out of the federal dollars and the state dollars to come down the pike that this stuff moves forward. We're focusing more on working class and lower income, moderate, moderate income communities and our focus, particularly with we're working on a project with both season this so i'm not going to spend any more time on this i just want to end with a general you know concept which i love all these presentations and i love the language which we use to 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 move forward our values but we and this is a challenge for us here on long island we've got to connect better to uh working people to folks that are mostly concerned about economics right now a lot of the language we all use just isn't working like radically so we have to break it down on a community level, on a safety level, on a quality of life level, on a, you know, really there's an equity and fairness issue, but you got to use language that, that connects right with, with people in their day-to-day -day lives. So that's been kind of our focus. We had a thousand people, our Smart Growth Summit recently, just strategizing on this stuff. And, and, and so we're, we're kind of ready to take it on, you know, we continue to take it on, but I think it's a challenge for the movement. But the beautiful part is there's resources, as you said, better from the Fed, from the feds there, but we got to retool and connect better and maybe listen a lot more. You know, I find a lot of us, sometimes we're so charged up with our presentations and our ideas and what we're passionate about that we don't listen to where people are at in real time. So I did want to say that. I know it might not be popular, but I, I did have to say that. I promised you I, I would be candid. So uh, I'll stop there. Sorry we went on too long. No, not at all. That was great. Um, thank you both, uh, Eric and Alyssa, for sharing what you're doing out on the island and, and really important uh, reminders of how uh, we do need to listen and, and meet people where they are and, and hear what the needs of the community um, are. So thank you so much uh, for sharing that and, and hope that you'll you know, stay in touch with us and, and keep working with us to, to build this movement and, and consider signing on to NY for TCI as well. Um, so that was um, our last speakers. Wow, we really traveled around the state uh, today and, and thank everybody so much for your fantastic presentations and all of the good work that's happening. It's very inspiring. And, and we will add those projects uh, that are not already reflected on the map. Um, and we only have you know, a few more minutes left, but I uh, wanna get to a couple of questions and also do wanna encourage people if you haven't already 
to please um, sign our letter to Governor Hochul uh, to urge her to support uh, TCI. Uh, we, we still want to see TCI included in the uh, Climate Action Council's plan for New York that's going to be circulating, um, you know, next year and, and hopefully uh, see TCI uh, live again. Um, it's a bit on pause right now, but it's, it's still uh, an important program and a, a great way to raise revenue, uh, potentially a billion dollars a year to support these types of clean transportation projects on the ground and and, and to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and transportation related pollution. So uh, that's a take action. Um, another take action, those of you who tune in regularly know we always like to, to wrap up with a take action um, or two or three. Uh, we also want to encourage people to check out the investment map uh, that we have been talking about. There's a link in the chat. Uh, to that and, and we're going to be continuing to add new projects and, and keep in touch with everybody who's been on today to see how we can better support and leverage the funding that's coming to New York to get these projects. Um, some of them are, are farther along than others, but get some going and, and help boost some and, and really scale up um, all of these equitable clean transportation projects. Um, so let's see, we have a couple of questions. I think we've been sort of answering them as we go, but um, Jacqueline Crawley made a couple of very interesting points and, and, and questions in the chat. And you know, rather than, than reading them, is Jacqueline still on or did she have to drop off? Usually we try to keep these to an hour, but because we had like so many eight speakers or something today, we, we extended it a bit. Um, but yes, she's still here. Thank you. Oh, you're still here. Okay, great. Well, so so tell us what's on your mind. You you had a couple of great questions, but I thought it would be best for you to just uh, share rather than than read. Sure. So I live in Manhattan in the Mary Hill neighborhood and take the bus all the time. I don't have a car, which is absolutely wonderful. I noticed that the buses are slated to be replaced. They're now diesel, a few electric hybrid, but the rate of replacement with fully electric buses is very slow. Uh, the next batch, they're supposed to be in 2022, maybe 60 buses. It seems that this would be the ideal project for federal infrastructure funds to quickly replace the entire city's fleet of buses, which are in constant use with electric buses and to build charging stations that will accommodate the increased need and uh, that we need to figure out who to pressure to make that acceleration real. If we got rid of all the diesel burning fuel, fossil fuel buses of New York City and other metropolitan areas in the state, we could significantly reduce carbon emissions. And this seems to me to be an initiative that perhaps this group, and I would be delighted to participate, could push forward in the right places, either at the Metropolitan Transit Authority or in the city or state governments. Thank you uh, for sharing those thoughts, uh, Jacqueline, and couldn't agree more uh, that we'd need to speed up electrifying uh, the MTA's buses and, and buses across the state. Um, I will just flag that uh, there's a campaign uh, some of you may be aware of called Electrify New York. I put a link in the chat. It's electrifyny.org. New Yorkers for Clean Power uh, worked on launching that. I think it's been a couple of years now. Um, and uh, it's a great effort, great collaborative effort by a number of organizations. Um, and one of the priorities that, that Electrify NY uh, is working on is a bill called the Green Transit Bill which would require um, you know, zero emission, all electric buses be purchased uh, statewide by uh, transit agencies. So it's, it's, but it's a little bit more of a transition probably than you would like to see because it you know, wouldn't start until 2029, which is the commitment that the MTA has made as well to only purchase all electric um, zero emission buses starting in 2029. 
Um, so it's exciting that that's happening um, and we want to see it statewide. I think the biggest obstacle has been cost um, to, to quickly electrify. But as you rightly pointed out, now with federal money, uh, hopefully uh, we will be able to, to accelerate that transition, um, support that kind of legislative effort and, and also more organizing on the ground. Uh, especially in the city, um, you know, directed towards the MTA. So, you know, I don't know if anybody else uh, has thoughts to respond to Jacqueline, but I think, you know, very point, well, you know, important point that you've made and, and would love to follow up with you so, so that we can um, work together on this. Uh, but does anybody else have, have thoughts that they want to share uh, related to Jacqueline's point? But I can make a comment because we're, we're doing that in Buffalo as well. Uh, I think our first electric buses are going to be in 2022. It's taken some time because they've had to redo their infrastructure in their garages to be able to do all the electricity to charge them at night. But it is happening. Uh, it's happening slowly. And they're getting money from the, from the state and Cuomo's push for electrifying uh, transit. So it's, there is money out there. I know they got some money, I believe, from the Volkswagen settlement as well. So it's a good thing and we should do it. And it's not just to, you know, for greenhouse gases, but it's also the pollution that's pumped out of those buses all the time. But let me point out, though, that if you look at the, at the greenhouse gases uh, sources, one, only 1% one comes from buses, you know, more than half come from cars. So we still have to focus where the problem is. And that's all the cars. We need to have more buses, clean buses, running more often, and, and, and then have some high speed, high capacity transit supplementing that to get people out of their cars, because that's where the problem really is. Yes, totally. Thank you, Doug, for chiming in. Um, does anybody else uh, want to comment to uh, Jacqueline's point or have any other kind of final remarks or thoughts that have come to you while you've been listening to other people's presentations? Any of other, our other panelists? Meanwhile, I just want to thank you, Betta, for uh, allowing me to raise this point. This has been a fascinating meeting, and I really appreciate everybody's tremendous work. Well, thank you so much for joining and uh, look forward to seeing you in the future on these. And, uh, we, you know, we wouldn't um, have the kind of, you know, movement success that, that we do if it weren't for the fantastic advocates, you know, across the state who tune into Zoom events and in-person events and take action and sign petitions and, you know, learn and, and get involved in all of these important issues that relate to decarbonizing our economy. So I so appreciate you being here, Jacqueline, and everybody for joining today. Um, I know that, you know, time is precious. And so anytime that you decide to spend with us, we, we do appreciate it. Um, so any, any other uh, last thoughts or um, issues that we should talk about before we wrap up? And I just have a reflection, which is after hearing all these wonderful presentations happening in different geographies around the state, it also occurs to me that we should all probably be holding hands a little bit more. I know that's really hard to do because we all focus like I'm so zoned in on Yonkers, but to the points about connectivity that were also made earlier. I don't know how to do that, but it strikes me that there's work we can do together that may make our individual projects much stronger. To that point, I had put in a link and I'm just gonna re-put it in. Of, um, it was a trails, Rails to Trails article that kind of outlined some of the opportunities that are at the federal level. And I think one of the tangible things we can do is support um, all the efforts that um, we've outlined earlier about the action and, the, and sign the petition. Um, you know, people should rally and support these ideas, but also as we're working to organize funding, we should alert each other. And as we're putting in for um, grants and such, we should discuss those things with each other and get letters of support for each other's projects to demonstrate to the people that might be um, interested in supporting something that there is a sort of cohesive network and that there is a sense of connectivity to all these projects. A letter of support um, for a project in Buffalo that's coming from a project in Albany or projects in um, the Hudson Valley and shows that there's um, a larger vision at place, I think would have a lot of weight and a lot, have a lot of gravity 
um, to the people that might be receiving it. Uh, I, I just want to comment on something that occurred to me. I've been having some difficulty working with green, the Greenways people, particularly those that, that are on the bike trails and Greenways in Ulster County that are, are run by or owned by conservation organizations. Um, we're trying to figure out how farmers and others, uh, pro food processors can move along those bike trails with cargo bikes, um, either on certain limited times or uh, to be able to share it because we know we need to eliminate short, short haul truck traffic um, between um, suburban areas and cities and within cities and the, the obvious place is uh, like what they're doing in Europe is they're having dedicated bike, um, you know, bike trails along public streets that accommodate cargo, cargo bikes as well. So it's just some, it's a thought that um, we have to, perhaps it's just a matter of education and getting some people to understand that these don't take up a whole lot more room than a regular bicycle. Uh, and I remember when I first using an electric assist bike on the trails, I got some pushback too. But this is, uh, I think this is something we have to think about is how do we accommodate um, you know, short haul last first and last mile logistics along the rail trails and along greenways. Thanks for sharing that, Andy. And I think, you know, Bridget's point and yours about just better communication and, you know, sharing best practices and helping to educate each other as advocates is, is so essential. Um, I don't know. Yeah, from here, maybe we can can help to convene some kind of collaborative clean transportation table if people are interested in, you know, continuing the conversation. Um, but any, any last thoughts, uh, from other folks? Okay. Well, it's one twenty-six. So you have a few more minutes, uh, before whatever your next thing is. Um, this is probably the last time that we're getting together, um, guessing as a big group in, in 2021. Um, so just want to wish everybody a wonderful rest of the year. Stay healthy. Uh, and we'll look forward to, to seeing you, if not before, in, in 2022. Thanks for all that you do uh, to make New York a greener, cleaner place. And, uh, and there's also a link in the chat if you're interested in, in having someone come to your community for a Green the Grid and Electrify Everything presentation. So let us know if you're interested in that and, and we'll follow up with uh, slides from this and other links and stay connected and, and keep building. So thanks so much, everybody. Really appreciate you all. Thank you, Betta. Thank, Thank you. Thanks, thanks Betta. Thank you.